go back. Let's talk about the addition of halogens onto that multiple bond. As mentioned earlier, due to polarization, just the alkene approaching your dihalogen, you have um, the creation of delta pluses and delta minuses on either of those two chlorines. And the element that's closest to the alkene is the one that gets attacked by the alkene producing a carbocation. In this case, um, this would be a primary carbocation, which will not be particularly good. But if the chlorine, the one that's the, you know, quote unquote, pseudo less electronegative one, the one that develops the delta plus, attaches to the carbon with the most H's, then you create a better carbocation, in this case, a secondary carbocation which then is attacked by the second chlorine, which is now in the form of a chloride, forming the final product. Now, if you consider the bond length of double bonds, 1.34 angstroms for the alkene, 1.20 angstroms for the alkyne, what you end up seeing is that in comparison to the atomic radii of the halogens, a bromine and for sure iodine, they are big enough that the entire atom, the, the entire bromine atom or iodine atom can sit on top of both carbons on that double bond. And that has a specific outcome that uh, will dictate what will happen in this type of reaction. So if you've never interacted or, or used bromine in the past, uh, it is actually a, a dense red liquid with a very low um, boiling point. Uh, so this vapor pressure is actually kind of high and you can kind of see it here because of all the red fumes that are present on top of the liquid face. And this is actually a very toxic substance. So you have to be careful, you know, when you're using it. But you pretty much undergo the same event that we saw with chlorine in, in essence the side of the dibromine molecule that is closest to the alkene develops that delta plus charge to it and gets attacked by the alkene. The bond, the bonded electrons move over to the other bromine to create bromide. And if we attach to the carbon that has the most hydrogens, then we're gonna create a secondary carbocation. But as I mentioned earlier, the size of bromine is large enough that it can actually sit on both of those carbons. And technically speaking, that's exactly what it does. It does sit on both of those carbons and stabilizes that carbocation that would have formed right here on the left side with its lone pairs. In essence, it forms this bromocyclopropane structure known as a bromonium ion. And the reason why this has now a positive charge is because the bromine is donating partially one of its lone pair of electrons to stabilize that carbocation on the left side of the molecule. Now the bromide that has been formed during the course of the first step of the reaction is ready to attack. And the attack is always going to take place on the carbon that is the most substituted or the carbon that has the least amount of H's. And the reason why is because even though you have the bromonium interacting with both carbons, the interaction is lesser with the carbon that is more substituted because of two reasons. One, that carbon is the better carbocation, so it doesn't need to have as strong an interaction as the carbon here on the right side um, with bromine. And the second one is because this carbon being the more substituted is also the one that has the most steric strain so bromine, you know, finds it a little bit more difficult to be around this carbon than the carbon on the right side that is least substituted. So the end result is that the bromide will attack the more substituted carbon, giving you, in essence, what we would call a Markovnikov product. Although in this case, it's a little bit, a little bit redundant to call it that because the two atoms being bonded are the same type. So you end up forming your dibromo compound. But the thing to 
definitely be aware of is that because the attack can only happen opposite of where the bromonium ion is positioned, what ultimately that means for the outcome of this product is that you're going to end up with an anti-configuration, meaning that the bromo group attached at the end is going to be opposite in phase to the bromo group that was there from, you know, the bromonium ion intermediate. So we call this the anti-configuration and we get that every time. And the reason why is because of that bromonium, uh, bromonium ion that gets formed. Now, many times what we discuss in chemistry, these uh, mechanisms, and we talk about, okay, these are the intermediates that we expect to form that explain how uh, we go from reactant to product. You know, some of them are just postulates because they represent uh, intermediates that we don't get to isolate. But here is a clever example of an experiment in which that very intermediate was isolated. And it had to do with an alkene in which um, the groups bound to the alkene carbons happen to be uh, groups that are very bulky. This is called an adamantane group. And you have two of them bound to either side of the alkene. So when the alkene approaches uh, dibromine, it first forms that bromonium ion. And the bromide that will be attacking from the opposite end, it actually can do so because, as you can see here, the diaxial interactions of this cyclohexane portion of the adamantane group are literally sticking in the place where the bromide has to come in to attack because the bromide can only attack from the opposite face of the bromonium, so it really can't do it. Uh, so what ends up happening is that the bromide instead just attacks a second equivalent of dibromine forming tribromide and ultimately what is isolated is a salt of the bromonium cation with tribromide and as you might expect ionic salts tend to form um, crystals solids and that was definitely not the exception here because a crystal structure was obtained for this particular bromonium intermediate and this is kind of phenomenal because this is not a drawing of what the molecule we think ought to be this is not a rendition of it. This is actual experimental data. This is the crystal structure of that bromonium intermediate that was isolated by this elegant uh, design of the alkene. You know, make it bulk enough that you make it impossible for the bromide to attack from the opposite end, then you have no choice but to basically be stuck at this specific point in the mechanism. And so this is this is fantastic. You know, you isolate the molecule, you crystal, you actually crystallize it out and get the crystal structure. You can clearly see that's your bromonium um, cyclopropane structure, your bromocyclopropane structure, and the bonds, uh, specifically of the carbons that used to be part of the double bond. You can see that clearly that is longer than your um, typical double bond length, and it's a little bit shorter than your carbon-carbon single bond, but it is closer to that than it is to the double bond length. So that's a, that's a phenomenal um, achievement in my opinion, right? And there were various papers where this type of molecule was formed and studied. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to point that out. Sometimes you can actually isolate these intermediates if you're clever enough in designing your molecules. Okay, now that brings us over to the alkynes. What happens when, if instead of an alkene, you react dibromine with an alkyne? Well, a similar process takes place. The alkyne attacks dibromine via the polarization of the bond. And in the process, you kick out bromide. And yes, you're gonna form initially what will be called a very terrible carbocation, a vanillic carbocation that on a double bond. But the bromonium, which is big enough to sit on that entire alkene, does so, creating yet again a new bromonium ion. Uh, this time, part of which you know forms part of a bromocyclopropene structure. And then, at this point, the bromide that was also forming the process attacks the carbon that is the most bulky or the most substituted opposite of the face of the bromonium ion, creating once again a trans configuration for the dibromo molecule. So this is in essence the same type of thing that happens with the alkene. So of course, if you were to add a second equivalent of dibromine, 
the alkene will react with it and you will form your tetrabromo alkane. But other than that, it's the same idea. The key attribute to be emphasized here is that if you do have bromide or if you do use bromide, that's what's being added first onto the multiple bond, you will form that bromonium ion. And because the bromonium ion is locking in place what would have been a carbocation, rearrangements are not going to happen. Notice that this could have been a secondary vanillic carbocation that would have easily rearranged to a tertiary carbocation next door. But it doesn't do it because the bromonium is sitting right on top of it and preventing it from undergoing that rearrangement. This does not happen with chlorine, at least not as easily as it does with bromine. Um, and something similar happens with iodine too, just because the size of iodine is even larger than bromine. So that will be something to keep in mind. Okay, in the next video, we will talk about the addition of HBr via an anti-Markovnikov configuration, which is to say that you will add the least electronegative group to the carbon that contains the least number of hydrogens, and we'll see why that happens. So we will see you in the next video.